The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, well, let's get started. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, competition. Um, just once again, to fit, I want you to try to, try, to try to have in your mind sort of an, a flow chart of where the course is all going. Where does this fit in? We talked last time about how firms decide on the cost minimizing way to produce a given level of output through the tangency of the isoquant and the isocost. And we talked about how um, if you were consumers, we'd be done then. Consumers just find the tangency and difference curve and the budget constraint and they're done. But firms aren't done because the level of output, unlike the budget, which is given to you as a consumer, the level of output's not given to the firm, they get to choose it. So with firms, we have to go one step further. We actually have to choose the level of output that'll be produced. We don't just choose the way to produce it, but actually how much to produce. So this is for consumers, it'd be sort of like consumers choosing what their budget constraint is, okay? And the way we do that is we bring in, since we now have a third variable, which is how much to produce, we have to bring in a third equation. And that equation we bring in is essentially the market. Essentially, we say the market imposes conditions on the firm, which helps them figure out how much to produce. So we take all the stuff we did before, we then take that and put that in a market. And the market interacts with the firm. And from that market setting, the firm derives how much to produce. Okay, so basically the level of production for a given firm, little q, will be derived from how firms behave in different market settings. And the market setting we're going to start with today is the classic starting point for economics, which is the market setting of perfect competition. We're going to start talking about perfectly competitive markets, a benchmark of perfect competition. What perfect competition, this is basically a case where many firms are selling goods to many consumers. We're then going to, in the next few lectures, talk about more realistic alternatives like monopoly, which is not a game but rather a market structure, which is basically a case where one firm sells to many consumers, or oligopoly, my favorite word in all of economics, which is when, not because I like the topic so much, I think it's a cool word, um, which is when several firms sell to a large market, which is probably the most realistic setting of all. And we're going to come to talk about those. But today we're going to start with our benchmark of perfect competition. Now what is perfect competition? Okay. Basically, I can give you a technical definition. <coughs> Technically, perfect competition exists whenever firms are price takers on both the output and inputs markets. They're price takers on both the output and input markets. So perfectly competitive firms are price takers. That is, no action that they take can affect either the price at which they sell their goods or the price that they pay for their inputs. No action, they're price takers, they're not price makers. No action they take affects either the price at which they sell their goods, no action the individual firm takes affects either the price at which they sell their goods or the price they pay for their inputs. Okay, well when will this be true? Well, we think about, go back to lecture one. Technically, this would be true if a firm faced perfectly elastic demand for their goods. If you face perfectly elastic demand for goods, and if they had perfectly elastic supply of inputs. Under those conditions, firms would be perfectly competitive. If they face perfectly elastic demand for their goods, and perfectly elastic supply of inputs, okay? So let's focus on the first of those, okay? Which is perfectly elastic demand. Let's take a look at figure 10-1, okay? These should be little Qs, by the way. This isn't a market, this is a firm. These should be little Qs. So basically, what you have here is that um, you have a firm facing a perfectly elastic demand. What that means is any, what that means is the firm's quantity is pegged by their supply curve. Or in other words, the point is the firm cannot change the price one iota from that level P. Okay? 
So in other words, if there's supply shift, if say the first price of the firm's inputs go up, the firm doesn't get to charge any more for their goods. They just sell fewer goods. Okay, so the supply shift from S1 to S2, the firm's going to move from list should be little Q1 to little Q2. They're going to reduce the quantity they sell, but they cannot change the price because they face perfectly elastic demand. Okay? So when does this make sense as a description of the world? Well, it makes sense as a description of the world under four conditions. Okay, so there's four conditions under which perfect competition will exist. Four conditions. The first condition is identical products. A firm will be in a perfectly competitive market when the firms in that market sell identical products. Now, let's be clear. They don't have to literally be identical. They have to be perceived by consumers as identical. So when I say identical products, they don't have to literally be identical. But consumers have to consider them identical for purposes of their, de their demand across firms. So firms have to sell identical products uh, for there to be perfect competition. Because if products aren't identical, then firms will be able to charge different prices from each other because they have something different to sell. Okay? So firms need to be identical. Second of all, consumers uh, have to have full information on all prices. That is perfect competition. Well, let me write down the next two conditions because they're related. And the third is low transaction or shopping costs. OK, these two are critical because the way perfect competition is going to work is firm, consumers are going to shop across firms selling identical goods. And they're going to buy from the cheapest one. OK? And if there's any failure of either of these, then consumers might not know if you're the cheapest. And therefore, you might be able to charge extra. So perfectly elastic demand, OK? Once again, we get into the micro foundations of something we discussed in the second lecture. We discussed very elastic demand. Now we're talking about where that comes from. What conditions do you need? Perfectly elastic demand is going to require that consumers know all the prices and can costlessly shop across all the options. Okay? Otherwise, firms might have some opportunity to charge different prices. Okay? And finally, and we'll come back to why this is important, there needs to be free entry and exit of firms. This one I can't really give you intuition for yet. Just take my word for it. We'll come back to why that's important. OK? We'll come, by, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to why that's important. So basically, what you want for, per, for example, a perfectly competitive market, you want a market where producers are selling homogenous goods in an easily informed, easily shopped arena. OK? So to my best, I think the best example of perfectly competitive market is those guys selling like schlocky touristy things around uh, Port Authority in New York or in any sort of large open air market. OK? Basically, in that area, these guys all sell the same crap. OK? You can go from one to one quite easily, and it's quite easy to find out what the prices are. That's not perfectly easy, but it's quite easy to find out what the prices are. That is the conditions for a perfectly competitive market. It's easy to shop because they're all in the same area. Prices are pretty easy to observe, and the products are all basically identical. Okay, you can also only, only so many little statues of liberty you can buy. Okay, so basically that's sort of an example of a perfectly competitive market. Now, in reality, no perfectly competitive market exists. Okay, there's never been a perfectly competitive market. Okay, but this is sort of as close as 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 we can sort of get. Now, now that question is about that. Now that provides a good moment to pause and talk about Peter Diamond, who just won the Nobel Prize in economics. This is our my MIT economics, Peter Diamond, MIT econ, Peter Diamond shirt. OK? Peter Diamond, who just won the Nobel Prize in economics. Peter Diamond is the greatest economic theorist of his generation, sort of the next, the heir of the Paul Samuelson, Bob Solo generation that founded this economics department and made it great. Peter Diamond was sort of the next generation that led this economics department forward and kept it great. And Peter has made contributions throughout economic theory and should have won the Nobel 10 times over. What they finally gave it for him on Monday, gave it to him on Monday for, was for search theory. 
And search theory is essentially about what happens when markets don't work like these vendors around Port Authority in New York, when markets aren't perfectly competitive. Okay? Where basically you have markets where there are some mismatch and some search costs that sellers have to pay to find the right buyers and buyers have to pay to find the right sellers. Okay? So the best example here and the example for which I really gave the Nobel Prize was the labor market. It was about search costs in the labor market. And what Peter Diamond and his fellow co-winners talked about was about how in the labor market you have firms have vacancies. They have jobs they want to fill. Individuals have labor supply. They have jobs. They want to provide themselves these jobs. And so there's unemployment. There's people out of jobs looking for jobs. But there's vacancies. There's jobs that are empty. And both exist at the same time. And how can that be? In our perfectly competitive market, that couldn't be. You couldn't have both jobs looking for people and people looking for jobs. But what Diamond wrote down and these other theorists developed in their models is basically how you get these frictions in the labor market where since these jobs have specific characteristics employers are looking for, you can't quite match the vacancies to the unemployed workers. That there's this sorting process where some are easy to match. You can take the high school dropout and put them at McDonald's. That's easy. But the job which involves in, requires some computer skills, you've got to find the right guy to take that. Okay? And basically, it's these frictions that lead to what we call the natural rate of unemployment in our economy, which is the notion that no economy would ever get down to zero unemployment. That's impossible. And the reason is because there'll always be some frictions and some mismatch. There'll always be some inability of people to find the right people to fill their vacancies. Now, we don't know what the natural rate is. When I was in grad school, we learned the natural rate was 7%. Okay. In the 1990s, the natural rate seemed to fall to about 4%. That is, we got to about a 4% unemployment rate. Now, who the heck knows what the natural rate is anymore? And a big debate right now among economists and macro is how much of our 9.6% is an increase in the natural rate, which is something the government can't really fix very well, versus short-term demand reductions, which the government could fix by pumping more resources into the economy. And all that is informed theoretically by the work that Peter Diamond did. Now, I hope what I just described sounded pretty obvious to you. And that's good because that's what great theory does. Great theory ex post sounds obvious. Okay? It's just ex ante. Before Peter Diamond did this, people always said, well, we have these perfectly competitive markets. This is how they should function. And he's the guy who really taught us how real markets should function like this. And that's why he uh, gets to go to Stockholm. So that's uh, very exciting for our economics department, very exciting for the profession, and just a great moment uh, really in sort of taking economics um, this, I saw it described very well in one article. Taking economics, this is sort of the beginning. These last few Nobel Prizes are the beginning of recognizing that economics is not what we teach in this course anymore. Okay? That you need what we teach in this course to go on in economics, but the, probably the first couple dozen Nobel Prizes were about what we teach in this course, and the last few have been about what you teach in the subsequent courses. And that's a real sort of evolution for economics to understand that we need to mature as a science and move beyond the basics uh, uh, that you learn in 1401 move beyond to these other things. So we're giving the basics here, but the excitement, the excitement happens elsewhere. OK? So very exciting time for our department and for the profession as a whole. Now, uh, with that little uh, diatribe aside, let's go back. So we have these. So now, having said all that, forget it. OK? Forget Peter Diamond existed. OK? We're now going to go back to perfect competition. And once again, as I said in the first lecture, and Peter would be the first guy to say, this is how he taught me to do economic theory. You've got to make simplifying assumptions if you want to get anywhere. So we're going to make the simplifying assumption of perfect competition. We'll weaken that as we go along. But for now, imagine it's perfect competition. Okay? And we have the situation of perfectly competitive firms. Now, a very important distinction to draw, and that's why it's important to remember that these are little Qs, not big Qs, is that the distinction between firm demand and market demand. Firm versus market. And this is something which is confusing, confuses me at times. I may even get it wrong at times. I'll need you to correct me. Okay? Which is that even if a given firm faces perfectly elastic demand, it doesn't necessarily mean that market demand is perfectly elastic. Okay? That is, the overall demand for little fake uh, statues of liberty, okay? little fake statues of liberty in, around Port Authority in New York is not perfectly elastic. Okay? As the price goes up, fewer people will buy them. The price goes down, more people will buy them. But for any given vendor selling them, it is perfectly elastic. Because there's always some place next door you can go. So it's very important to distinguish between the firm's demand, the demand facing the firm being perfectly elastic, okay, and the demand facing the market not being perfectly elastic. And the way to think about this is think about the concept of residual demand. 
residual demand, okay? So we have a demand function for a market, D of P, okay? We have a demand function for a market, okay, which is um, that uh, as the price goes up, demand goes down, okay? Now, the, f the demand function for a given firm, we'll call the residual demand, D super R of P, is equal to what? It's, given, it's equal to the demand for the market minus the supply that all other firms in the market provide, S super zero, sub S super zero of P. The supply that all other firms in the market provide. So my de the demand for my product as a firm is my residual demand. OK, is the market demand minus what other firms supply. Well, if you differentiate this with respect to price, OK, you'll see that DDR DP equals DD um, DP minus DS0 DP. OK, well, this first one we know is the firm's own this first one is the market demand curve. We know that's a negative number because demand curve sloped down. We don't, we're not assuming given goods. We know that's a negative number. But this is a positive number. Supply curves slope up. The amount that other firms in the market will supply as the price goes up is positive. Right? Supply curves slope up. So this is a negative number, but this is a positive number, which means by definition, this is a very negative number. Okay, that the firm's residual demand responds more to price than the market's demand does. Because the firm's residual demand is after all the supply of other firms. Okay? So we can rewrite this in terms of elasticities. So let's assume for a second that all firms are identical. Okay? Assume for one second we're in a market where all firms are identical. That little q equals big Q over n. Okay? Assume all firms are identical. Okay? And so therefore, the amount produced by other firms, Q super zero, is N minus one times Q. Okay? So basically, uh, the amount uh, that's produced by other firms is N minus one times Q. So the last demand facing a given firm, a, uh, epsilon sub i, is N times the elasticity demand for the entire market minus um, N minus one times the elasticity supply for the market. Okay? So for example, Let's say you've got a market with 100 firms in it, OK? Not you know, a big market, but not outrageously big. We have plenty of markets with more firms than that. And let's say that the elasticity of demand for this market equals minus 1. So it's an in-between elastic and inelastic, not a crazy number. And the elasticity of supply is 1, OK? Let's just say that's the example. Then what you get is that for a given firm, if you use this formula, the elasticity of demand facing a given firm is minus 199. It's a huge negative number. Okay? So even though the market demand has an, is, is modestly elastic, you know, minus 1, it's elastic but not crazy, the demand facing a given firm is crazy elastic. Okay? So basically the point is that even if a market does not have super elastic demand, a given firm can face very elastic demand. And that's what can lead to perfect competition. Okay? It's very important to keep those distinct. We talk about demand, thinking about demand at the firm level versus demand at the market level. Okay? Demand at the market level, that's, to, that's about substitutability with other goods and the things we've talked about deriving demand curves. Okay, we derive demand curves, we're not deriving firm demand curves, we're deriving market demand curves. And so the demand curve was a function of elasticities and substitu uh, of substitutability across goods. The firm demand good, the firm demand curve is a function of all that, but also how many firms are in the market. Okay, if there's a lot of firms in the market, it's going to be very elastic in a perfectly competitive market. Okay, questions about that? Okay, important distinction to keep in mind. Now, with that as background, let's now come to profit maximization, which is what this is all about. Remember, I said just like the whole, we assume that every decision consumers made make is driven by utility maximization. Every decision producers make is driven by profit maximization. So let's talk about profit maximization in the short run. Profit maximization in the short run. How do firms maximize profits in the short run? OK. Now, the first question we have to ask is, what is profits? OK. 
Okay. Well, that seems pretty straightforward. Uh, I defined those already. I said the profits were equal to revenue minus costs. Okay. Profits are equal to revenue minus costs. Well, the trick is that there's two different types of people who measure costs. Revenue is revenue. It's just basically the money you make, and kind of anybody can measure that. But there's two different ways of measuring costs. There's accounting costs, and there's economic costs. And these are different concepts. Okay. Accounting costs are cash flow costs, what you actually pay. So your accounting costs are what you actually pay. Okay? So if you buy something for x dollars, that's your accounting costs. Okay? The economic costs are about opportunity cost, which is not about what you lay out in cash, but what you could have done with that cash. It's not just about what you lay out, but what you could have done with that cash. Okay? So to give you an example, Let's just do a simple example, OK? Imagine that you graduate. Um, and You're going to graduate. I don't mean that. You're going to graduate. Uh, imagine after you graduate, um, you, uh, you decide you're going to start a website design firm on the side. You know, you're just going to do this while you decide what to do with the rest of your life, you're trying to figure out where to go to grad school, whatever. You'll start a website design firm. That seems easy. OK. Basically, how does the website design firm work? Basically, you work full time, and you hire some slave programmer who works for you, does all the you know, grunt work. Okay, and let's say that you have to pay them forty thousand a year. Okay, so it's going to be you working full time plus some slave programmer. You're going to pay forty thousand dollars a year. Okay, now um, and let's say that you have a computer that's like you know six months old, a year old. It's still pretty good shape. It's not brand new. It's still in pretty good shape. And you just let the slave programmer use that, so you don't have to buy a new one. Okay, so you've got the programmer. You're paying him forty thousand. You're letting him use your computer. Your work, you buy some new computer you're working on. You, so you do your work. He does his work. You put it together. At the end of the year, you tally up all the receipts you've had from your website design, and you've made $60,000. Okay? So you sit back and say, well, that's pretty good. I put in $40,000. I paid $40,000. I brought home $60,000. That's $20,000 in profit. That's not a bad profit. Okay? If we think about profit margins, then we'll often think about you, you, profit margins. We'll often think about profit relative to revenue. Well, that's twenty thousand dollars in profit on six thousand dollars in revenue. It's a thirty-three percent profit margin. Most companies would kill for that. Okay, so you say that's not bad. Made made a thirty-three percent profit margin. But what opportunity costs did this calculation miss? So if you were an accountant, you'd stop there, and that's why accountants don't make as much as economists because we're better. Okay, if you're an accountant, you'd stop there. But if you're an economist, what do you recognize? What did this calculation miss? What opportunity costs were involved in running this firm that the cash flow calculation didn't capture? Yeah? Um, yeah, that's about, OK, that's sort of a different issue. That's sort of about the fact that you might not have produced as efficiently as possible. I'm not asking that question. I'm not asking, did you run? I'm asking, given the numbers I gave you, why did I misstate your economic profit? Yeah, in the back. I could have gotten another job that paid more. Here's the other thing about it. I just spent an entire freaking year, and I made $20,000. OK, you're hoping you do better than that with an MIT degree. At least your parents are hoping you do better than that with an MIT degree. OK, so basically, the, opportunity, the first source of opportunity cost, what this has missed, is the value of your time. That doesn't show up as an accounting cost, but it's a real opportunity cost because you could have had another job. So let's say you could have gone out and made $60,000 a year, okay? that you could have easily found a job making $60,000 as, as an MIT graduate. Well, then that's a cost of running this website, which is that by spending the year setting this up, you forego, forgo, 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 I don't know what the past tense of forgo is, forgo, forgo, uh, $60,000 in income you could have earned. Okay? You've, for, you've forgone $60,000 you could have earned. That's a real cost. It's not an accounting cost. It didn't show up in anybody's books, but it's an opportunity cost. What else? Yeah? Also, the 40000 that you paid the program, you could have invested it somewhere You could have invested that $40,000. You, you gave him the $40,000. You paid it. It's gone. If you put it in the bank, you could have earned interest on that money. 
That's an opportunity cost. And we'll come back and talk about capital markets and interest later. But that's opportunity cost. What else? There's one more. Yeah. I could have sold the computer. I could have sold the computer. I gave it to him and he used it for free. But if I could have sold that for a thousand bucks, that's an opportunity cost as well. So in fact, if I could have worked for 60, on that 40,000, I could have made you know, $2,000 of interest. And I could have sold the computer for 1,000. Then actually, my opportunity costs were 63,000, OK? Plus the 40,000 I paid the guy. So actually, the entire cost of the operation was 103,000. So I actually lost 40, 000, more than $40,000 running my little website business. OK? So opportunity costs represent the fact that you could have done other things with your resources. It's not just the fact that your cash flow said positive 20,000. Your economic flow said minus 43,000. Because while you're plus 20,000, you were minus 60 that you could have earned, down down to minus 40. You're minus 2 you could have earned an in interest on the money you paid the programmer, down down to minus 42. And you're down another minus 1 you could have made by selling that computer. So you're at minus 43. Okay? So you actually lost money. So when we talk about profit, we want to be thinking about economic profit, not accounting profit. Now, I'm not going to make that distinction much now, but I want you to keep that in mind as you go out and think about starting your business, or think about whether firms are profitable. To remember, we used to use an economic concept, which accounts for opportunity costs, not just an accounting concept, which follows the dollars. OK? Questions about that? OK, now, armed with this, we now say, OK, how does a firm maximize profits? Well, that's easy. We say that profits as a function of quantity produced is revenues as a function of quantity produced minus costs as a function of quantity produced. Remember, what was our goal that we laid out to start this lecture? It was to figure out what little q a firm chooses. Well, what little q a firm chooses is dictated by maximizing this equation. So a firm will choose little q such that dr dq equals dc dq. That's the profit maximizing equation. A firm will choose its quantity such that dr dq equals dc dq. Okay? That's a, or to put it in economic terms, that where marginal revenue equals marginal costs. The firm will choose to produce a quantity Q where its marginal revenue, which is the revenue made from producing the next, selling the next unit, equals its marginal cost, which is the cost incurred by, selling the, by making the next unit. Okay? Well, in a competitive market, we know what DRDQ is. Because remember, in a competitive market, DRDQ is given to the firm by the market. In a competitive market, DRDQ, or marginal revenue, equals the price. The price is given to the firm. It comes from God in the competitive market. We'll, come, we'll talk later about where it comes from, but for now, let's consider it God. Okay? They're price takers. They just get some price handed to them. Okay? So in a competitive market, we know what marginal revenue is. It's price. So what this says is that in a competitive market, the profit maximizing equation is price equals marginal cost. Memorize it. Put it under your pillow. OK? In a competitive market, price equals marginal cost is the profit maximizing condition. You will produce until the marginal cost of producing the next unit is equal to the price you can sell that unit for in the market. OK? So to see that further, let's look at an example. Let's go to um, the next figure, okay, figure 10, 2A. Okay. For the next few examples, I'm going to use a particular cost function. The cost function I'm going to use to make this all concrete is um, C equals um, 10 plus 0.5 Q squared. Okay, that's the cost function I'm going to use. Okay? So armed with that cost function, and let's say the price in the market is 6. Okay? Let's say the price in the market is 6. Just pull it out of my hat. I don't even say it's a market for whatever. We're just doing an example. Okay? Now, what we have on this graph, we have a cost curve and a revenue curve. The cost curve literally graphs that function. So in other words, if you produce two units, Okay, then your cost is 10 plus half of 2 squared, or 12. Okay, if you produce two units, your costs are 12, and so on. You've got this cost curve. Okay? You've also got a revenue curve. Well, the revenue curve is just 6 times the number of units produced, because the price per unit is 6. So it's just a straight line uh, with a slope of 6. Okay? So each unit produced, you make 6. Okay? Now, um, what you'll see here is that um, the price, 
So for this cost curve, what's marginal cost? Well, if we differentiate this, we see that marginal cost equals Q. I've made this an easy example. If you differentiate that, you'll see that marginal cost equals Q. That is, just differentiate this cost equation. Marginal cost equals Q. So what that says is that the profit maximizing point is going to be to set marginal cost equal to price. So that says set Q equal to 6. And you're done. That's how much the firm should produce. Okay? The firm should produce 6 units because its marginal cost function is Q. It's a linear function. The price is 6. It's a horizontal line. So they only intersect in one point where quantity equals 6. Now what you notice in this graph is that this happens to be the point where the gap between the revenue curve and the cost curve is largest. These are not marginal, these are not marginal curves. This is revenue and cost. But notice that at 6, that's exactly where the revenue curve and the cost curve have the largest gap between them. I think a more intuitive way to see this is to flip to figure 10.2b. This shows the marginal profit that you make on every unit you sell. So in other words, if you sell fewer than two units, you lose money. Why? Because if you sell one unit, your costs are 10 plus 10.5. If you sell one, your costs are 10.5. Your revenues are six. You lose money. You lose four and a half. If you sell two units, you make zero. Your costs are 12. Your revenues are 12. You make zero. If you sell three units, your costs are 10 or 14 and a half, right? 10 plus half a nine. Your revenues are 18, so you make money. So each unit, you can calculate how much you're making on that next unit. On the third unit, you made money. Fourth unit, you make even more money. Okay? Fifth unit, even more. Sixth unit, you make the most money you can make. In the sixth unit, your costs are 10 plus half of 36, or uh, 18, so 28. Your costs are 28. Your revenues are 36, so you make a profit of 8. So you make a profit of 8 on that sixth unit. So think of yourself as deciding, it's walking up, think of yourself as climbing this hill. In economics, optimization is a hill climbing exercise. Think of yourself as climbing up this hill, okay, and asking yourself, should I make the next unit? Does the hill keep going up? Yes, it keeps going up. Make that next unit. Then you get to the top, and now you say, well, should I make the seventh unit? Well, I make a seventh unit, my costs are 10 plus half of 49, so 34 and a half, okay? My revenues are 42, so my profits are only 7 and a half. I make less profit on that seventh unit, so I shouldn't make it, okay? Now, you might say, wait a second, why, um, why wouldn't you make it? You still make profits. Why wouldn't you go ahead and make all units all the way down to 10? You still make profits on those units. And the answer is because of opportunity cost. The answer is that, yes, you make profits. But given where your marginal cost curve is, you can do better by, at that point, going and producing other goods. And that's why I care about accounting costs versus opportunity costs. Accounting costs would say, look, you're going to make money until you go to 10 units. But opportunity cost says no. At that point, the opportunity cost has gotten high enough that you can do better devoting your resources elsewhere. And that's why you want to stop at the point where you're at the top of the hill, where the price equals the marginal cost. OK? So what are the profits you make at the top of this hill? Well, if you go to the next diagram, we can see what the profits you make are. Okay. So this next diagram, figure 10.3, illustrates this example. So what we have here is an example with cost curves for this cost function. Once again, 10 plus 0.5 Q squared. Average cost is that line in the middle there. That's the line, that's, that's the average cost. You have an average variable cost that's a line that's linear. Okay, an average variable cost that has a slope of 1. Okay. You have an average fixed cost that's everywhere declining because your fixed cost of 10 is everywhere declining as you produce more and more your fixed cost declining. And as I said, you have a marginal cost of Q. So your marginal cost of one unit is one. Your marginal cost of two units is two, et cetera. Okay. 
So this draws out the cost curves that correspond to that cost function. Okay, you see them drawn out here. Now, we also on this diagram have a demand curve. The demand curve is perfectly elastic facing this firm. It's a perfectly competitive market. And that perfectly elastic demand curve has, is horizontal at price equals six. Okay? So what does the firm do? It chooses to produce where marginal cost equals price. Okay? When it produces where marginal cost equals price, then what profits does it make? Well, on each unit, it makes profits of the difference between marginal cost, I'm sorry, on each unit makes difference of the profits between the price and average cost. Okay? Now, it's an important distinction. We went over this in lecture and section again, but let me go through it again. Marginal cost is the cost of the next unit. Average cost, the average cost of all the units you've made. So if I make six units, what profit do I make? Well, on that sixth unit, okay, I make profit of like one in, a, it's about one in, one in an eighth, okay, or one in, well, it's, it's eight divided by six. So one in, one in, a, one in a, one and a quarter, okay. I make profits of one and a quarter on that, on that, uh, I make profits of one and a quarter on that sixth unit, okay. But I make those profits on all eight units I sell. So what that means is on, on, in total, I'm going to make eight profit of eight. The area of this rectangle is eight. Here's the key. You cannot choose a production level that produces a bigger rectangle than this. Okay? So if you produce seven, your rectangle will be longer. But the gap between price and average cost would be smaller. So your total rectangle size would fall. Okay, the largest rectangle is produced at a production level of six. That's the most efficient use of your resources, is when you produce at a point where marginal cost equals price. Because when you produce a marginal cost equals price, that causes the biggest, the maximum gap between price and average cost. Flip back for a second to the first figure. Okay, uh, not the first figure, the second figure, I'm sorry, 10-2. Okay. This relates back to 10-2. As I noted, the largest difference between your revenue and your cost curve was at six units. Okay? That's where the gap is large between revenue and cost. That's where you produce. Now we flip forward again to figure 10-3. Okay? You see that corresponds to the point of the largest gap between price and average cost. Okay? The largest gap between price and average, the largest gap, I'm sorry, we're the largest of the points on the marginal cost curve between price and average cost. So if you produce on the marginal cost curve, um, uh, if you produce seven units, then you're going to have a smaller gap between price and average cost. And therefore, even though you've produced one more unit and making profit on it, your total profits will fall. Okay? The key point is that, yes, climbing back down that hill, I still make money, but I make less and less money. Okay? And that, as a result, that rectangle is being reduced as I climb down that hill. That rectangle is maximized at the top of that hill. That's the point at which I make the most money. Okay? So that's why we say profit maximization, okay, uh, is, um, so I say profit maximization occurs at the point where price equals marginal cost, because that is the point of greatest gap between revenues and costs where price equals marginal cost, the point of greatest gap between revenues and costs, that's the profit maximizing point where that rectangle is largest. And you could should, should demonstrate for yourself, and you should, that at any other production level, that rectangle will be smaller. Okay? Questions about that? Yeah? Um, what do you do if you have a linear cost uh, function, so that means marginal cost is a constant? Then how do you determine the quantity? Uh, you don't. Uh, I mean, basically, you're right. I mean, you can only, it, 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 it's an indeterminacy. I mean, that's right. I'll, I'll try to avoid giving you problems like that. I mean, it basically, basically you get a corner solution. And a perfectly competitive market, there would, you'd be an indeterminate solution. A non-perfectly competitive market, you will have a determinate solution. But in a perfectly competitive market with a, with a linear marginal cost, you have an indeterminate solution. Either you produce zero or infinity. Uh, so you, you'd have an indeterminate solution. Um, OK, now. Just to further drill this in, imagine for a second there was a cost shock to the firm. 
Okay? Imagine there's a cost shock to the firm. Imagine that uh, there's a tax on the firm where the firm has to pay a tax of an amount T. Let's say T is a dollar. Okay? The firm has to pay a tax of a dollar on every unit they produce. Okay? Well, what is their new cost curve? Somebody tell me what the new cost curve is. If you have a tax of a dollar on every unit you produce, somebody tell, tell, me, tell me the equation for the cost curve. I didn't write down here, did I? No. Okay. What's the equation for the cost curve? Yeah? Just add plus TQ to the um, thing. Exactly. It's C equals 10 plus 0 0.5 Q squared plus TQ. Okay? Because for every unit you produce Q, you pay a tax T. It says T is a dollar, it'd just be plus Q. Okay? If T is a dollar, just be plus Q. Okay? So the cost function's now shifted. So what we see is that it shifted average costs and marginal costs both upwards. Okay? Average costs is shifted upwards by that amount. And average cost is shifted upwards. And marginal costs is shifted upwards by precisely a dollar. It's just a linear shift in marginal cost because marginal cost is now what? Q plus 1. If you differentiate this with respect to Q, assuming T is 1, okay, T is now a dollar, differentiate this with respect to Q, marginal cost is Q plus 1. So your marginal cost curve is shifted up by a dollar, or by T in this case, in, in the more general case. Okay? Well, what does that do to the firm's production decision? Okay? Well, now the firm is, it doesn't change their maximization formula. They still want to set marginal cost equal to price. So now they say, set Q plus 1 equal to price. Well, the price is 6, so it says set Q equal to 5. Now the profit maximizing level is 5 units. The profit maximizing level is 5 units. Okay? And this is basically, what this is saying is because the tax increased your marginal cost, you are now uh, producing less. And what we can see now, if we flip to figure 10-4, we can see what that's done to your profits. Your profits have now fallen, okay, to the dotted rectangle, the much smaller dotted rectangle, okay? Your profits used to be that entire slashed rectangle plus the dots, okay? Now, your profits are just where the marginal cost curve exceeds average cost, where the marginal, co where the price exceeds average cost, I'm sorry which is just that smaller dotted rectangle. Your profits have fallen dramatically. So by imposing a tax on this firm, we've dramatically reduced their profits. Okay? Now, this is the economics behind why taxes can lower production. Okay? Now, you might say, wait a second. In reality, if we tax a firm, they don't have to lower their profits. They just pass it on and charge consumers higher prices. Okay? But not in a competitive market. In a competitive market, they can't do that. If you tax a firm in a competitive market, it comes out of their, well, it comes, tax firm in a competitive market comes out of their profits. Okay? If you tax, because they face a perfectly elastic demand, so they can't raise the price, all they can do is just say, well, the price is the same, my marginal cost has gone up, I'm going to produce less, okay, and I'm going to make less profits, and that's, that's life. Okay? So a tax in a market like this is just going to lower the firm's profits, and it's going to lower their level of production. Uh, from six to five. In non-competitive markets, different things can happen. We'll talk about that. But in a competitive market, this is what happens with the tax. You basically set them new marginal cost equal to price, uh, and you get that they produce five units instead of six at a lower profit level. Yeah? Okay. The, but rem okay. You're right. Excellent point that I should have pointed out. In the short run, what do I mean by short run? What I mean by short run is remember. Labor's variable capital is fixed. What I mean in this context is think about the short run as being the period over time over which firms cannot enter and exit. So in the short run, let's, when we talk about competitive markets in the short run, we talked about competitive, short run being the time over which capital is fixed. Now we're going to add another condition. We're going to say the short run is the period of time over which there's no firm entry or exit. That's the short run. We'll come back and talk about what entry and exit does, and that's going to have some funky effects we'll talk about next time. But what we mean by short run here is no firm entry and exit. Whichever firms are in the market at the, uh, are, are in the, at the beginning of the short run period and the market at the end of the short run period. Yeah? But in your conditions, you had, free, you had like free and fluid entry and exit of firms. Right, exactly. And that's why I said don't pay attention to that yet. Okay. 
Those are those, so in some sense, those are conditions of perfect competition. I didn't say if that was short run or long run. Those are sort of the full long run set of conditions. That's why I said we're going to ignore four for now and just focus on the first three. In the short run, only the first three are relevant because in the short run, there's no firm entry or exit. In the long run, which we'll talk about next time, that fourth one will be relevant. Okay, good questions. That's a good point. Thank you for pointing that out. Other questions or comments? Okay, one other thing I want to cover before we stop, which relates to the long run, which is that in the long run, this is sort of the transition, the bridge talking about the long run, which is we also have to decide ultimately whether or not we want to shut the firm down. So in other words, we want to set price equal to marginal cost. That's one condition. But actually short run profit maximization has a second condition. Short run profit maximization has two conditions. The first is to set price equal to marginal cost. The second condition of short run profit maximization is to check whether the firm wants to shut down. Why would a firm want to shut down? It might want to shut down if it, if it actually loses money by continuing to produce. Okay? So a firm, and that's because firms may lose money but not shut down. Okay? Firms may lose money but not shut down. Or firms may lose so much money they shut down. And we need to uh, consider that. Okay? So for example, imagine the price in this market. Let's get rid of the tax. Let's go back to the mar marginal cost without the tax. Okay? Imagine the price in this market suddenly fell from 6 to 3. The price in the market is now $3 per unit you sell. Okay? Well, what would the firm's profits be? Well, if the price fell to 3, the firm would choose to produce three units, right? It would still have this, have this condition. Marginal cost equals price. Price is three. Marginal cost is Q, so Q is three. Still produce three units, OK? If it produced three units, its costs are 10 plus 4 and a half, which is 14 and a half. At a price of three, it makes nine. So its profits are negative 5 and a half, OK? It would lose money from this production. If the price fell to three, the firm would still choose. The firm, remember, marginal cost equals price. That doesn't vary with what the price is or anything. This is a, this is a maximizing condition. Okay? If the price changes, not like you change which equation you follow. You always follow this equation. The efficient production level is always marginal cost equals price, regardless of what the price is. Okay? So the price is three. The efficient thing to do would be to produce three units and lose money. Okay. Now, you might say, well, then that's stupid. Wouldn't they just? If that goes negative, wouldn't they just shut down? And the answer is in the short run, no. And the reason you wouldn't shut down the short run is what I talked about last time, which is about uh, the, for, the, the notion of sunk costs, which is in the short run, the fixed costs that you paid to produce are sunk. That is, they're unchangeable in the short run. In the long run, they're changeable. You can just leave. But in the short run, you've invested fixed costs of 10 in being in this market. You've paid a fixed cost of 10 to produce in this market. Given you're in this market and you've paid 10 to produce, you will not exit unless you lose more than $10. Okay? You will not shut down unless you lose more than $10. You will not shut down unless you're losing so much money that you can't cover your fixed costs. Because you've paid those fixed costs. In the short run, they're sunk. Okay, so unless you're actually losing more than your fixed costs, you will not you will not uh, you will not shut down your firm. Okay, this is actually pretty confusing. We're out of time, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let's we'll pick it up on Monday exactly at this point, and I'll go through some more of the intuition for this, and that'll be our segue talking about long run profit maximization, which we'll talk about uh, on Monday.